Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for now this third webinar from the Intermountain-led Hospital Engagement Network. We're really excited to have you today. And this is Lucy Savitz, the, the director. Um, a couple of reminders before we get started with the content. First, my apologies for the confusion on the invitation um, email. We're working on fixing that. Um, hopefully everybody got the correction that Jason Scott sent out on Friday. And I, I think that's probably true for at least those of you who are here with us right now. Um, but we do apologize for that. The other um, issue that was identified was that if there are a group of you sitting in a room um, enjoying the webinar together, but there's only one computer being activated, there will be one person who will be able to log on and get their CME or CEU credit. Other people in the room not with a computer or um, with their own computers will have to log on separately to do that. Once the webinar is posted, which we believe should happen within the next day or two, you can also go to that webinar, um, link to the posting, and it will take you to the survey so that you still will be able to get your CME and CEU credit. So we are working through those issues and we'll try and make it as seamless and easy as possible to be sure that everybody gets those credits. Um, if you have any problems with that, please email admin at henlearner.org. That's really the go-to place for any questions, concerns, or issues that you face in getting access to the materials um, and to get your CME and CEU credit. Um, a couple of other things that I'd like to make you aware of um, is that at henlearner.org, which is our website, that's really the, the sort of home base, if you will, for the content material. On the calendar there on the, uh, that you can link to from the first page, you'll see the dates um, and times of the upcoming webinars. Another thing that you will see starting to post there are affinity group calls. Um, in response to um, good ideas that we've received from our participants, there will be a monthly optional call on the 10 topical areas, and they will be introduced as the webinars occur. So you will see after our speaker today um, completes her talk on the very last slide, there will be a day of the month, a time of the month, and a single contact telephone number for those people, for example, today working on patient calls. They can call in and talk about the issues that they're facing, talk about success stories that they're having, um, and any kinds of other issues that you might want to discuss related to an affinity group of like-minded people who are working on that same topic. So um, please um, be sure to go to henlearner.org and look for more of that information as well on the calendar as a reminder. Another um, opportunity and, and would like to, even if you've done this already, encourage you to go to the Sign Up to Stay Connected field it's at the bottom lower right hand portion of the home page of henlearner.org and ask you to please sign up and there's an open text field that says what topics are you interested in and we're trying to build that database so that we keep you connected and don't send you too many emails but be sure we send the targeted emails. We've been working through a key contact in each of the delivery systems, and that may not be the right person for all of the topical areas. So we're asking um, the, the key points of contact, if there are people in your hospital, in your health system that you think are interested, please encourage them to go on and sign up. And then in that open text field, note the areas of interest so that we're, we're sure we get things to the right people at the right time. Again, if you've done that already, please do it again. Um, and we'll be sure we get it to you. The other thing I want to remind you of is the blog. Um, the blog, there's a, a link to it. Um, at the top of the page, there's a tab. And if you go to that blog, you'll find notices that Amy Ann Westrich is posting on key events, new information as it's being posted. Um, there's also an option there that you can um, request an RSS field. For those of us who don't know what that means, including myself, it means that we would send you an email when there's a new post to that blog. So it's another way for us to stay connected. If you have items that you'd like to contribute to that, we're more than happy to have you do that. You can send those to admin at henlearner.org. And again, that's our major mechanism for communication. We will be posting um, two success stories that we've received from 
pledged hospitals. We're really happy to report those will go up next week, and you'll see that posted in the blog. And then the last item that I want to um, just note for you is for the hospital contacts, so single main point of contact in the hospitals. This may not be everybody on the call today. Um, we will be sending out a quarterly survey on needs assessment readiness so that we can continue to tailor our programming and help to best meet your needs and be sure that you're seeing value for participation. That will be coming out on June 18th. So any questions, again, email them to admin at henlearner.org. More information, go to our website at henlearner.org. Right now, I'm very, very pleased to present our subject matter expert on patient falls. Um, Marlene Conti is a patient safety leader at Intermountain Healthcare. She's spent uh, numerous years, um, not that she's an old woman, she's a, what did we decide it was at the end of a seasoned um, professional <laughs> who's joined us and really put together a wonderful presentation um, for you today on how to address this important issue in patient falls. So without further ado, thank you very much, Marlene. Thank you, Lucy. Um, hopefully this will be uh, an opportunity for us to share what Intermountain has done <clears throat> but also to highlight what other organizations have done. And at the end, we will have some time for questions and then asking you uh, at the end also what kinds of things you need. And we can maybe follow up with <clears throat> one of the um, sessions, monthly sessions, with some additional information as well. <clears throat> so again, my name is Marlene. Um, Vicki Spuler was, was planning to join us today. She's a respiratory ICU manager um, at Intermountain Medical Center, which is Intermountain Healthcare's flagship facility, but has been an ICU manager and an ICU nurse for many years. She's a seasoned clinical expert as well. So I hope that I can appropriately represent her presentation. She was not able to join us at the last minute. So thank you all for participation, and please take notes and be prepared with questions at the end. Okay, so we have no conflict of interest in anything that we would be discussing today. Um, objectives for today's session include, um, at the end, you as the participants will be able to list a few key steps in how to get started if you've not already done so, and identify at least three strategies for reducing falls that you can implement at your facility or region or hospital or company and then list at least two outcome and or process measures that you can track and trend over time to demonstrate your performance improvement. Those are objectives. To get us started, um, I pulled some of the data that Bruce Bailey has collected from each of the hospitals that have signed on for the engagement network. And 42% of the hospitals noted that they had already implemented a FALLS program um, but that they had um, had some challenges with that process. 28% reported they had good progress, and 23% reported that they had sustained results over time. And I would like to think that the Intermountain Hospitals um, reported that they were having sustained results, but since I didn't personally respond, it'll be interesting to see what those facilities said. And we had a few that that they were not structured or they were just getting started. So about 5% of the facilities will probably want to pay a little closer attention to the how to get started information. Um, the next piece of data I pulled from that readiness survey was what level of learning the organizations had signed on to or committed to. So for the falls uh, subject matter area, 35% of the signed up hospitals expressed um, their commitment to be an active learner, which means they will participate in all of the webinars and education and have agreed to submit data. The 30% that are listed as real-time learners have agreed to participate actively. Data submission is optional. And the passive learners facilities, their expectation is that they will participate as much as they can in um, education and process improvement, there's no requirement or even uh, option for submitting data for those folks. So that's just a little bit of a summary of what we've um, been able to pull out of the initial assessment. So let's talk about getting started with the fall prevention program. And um, at Intermountain, we've had a falls program and a falls team, a system level falls team since 1998. So a couple of days. 
Um, and we continue to do uh, a refocus on what is our priority, uh, looking at our risk assessment tools, reevaluating and honing and revising reports and monitors. Um, the last couple of years, we've made formal uh, champions for falls, continue to work on care plans, and then initiate a plan, do, study, act. So if you're getting started, the first thing I would say for an organization is this has to be a priority with administrative support, and that means not just verbal support, but commitment to resources, um, employee hours, dollars for equipment, programming time, um, so that it's really backed up by actions and money and not just, yeah, this is a great thing to do, go out and do it without a lot of commitment. An organization must have adopted a standardized risk assessment tool. This is the patient risk assessment. And it's done by nursing um, professionals who assess their patients. And in Intermountain, we assess all patients on admission. Um, and then a minimum of daily, uh, it's recommended every shift to reassess their risk and then modify their care plan based on that. And then, of course, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So you must have some kind of a monitoring mechanism in place. Intermountain has had a robust event reporting system since the 80s, and we use our um, event reporting system. So it is a volunteer, voluntary system, but all staff members are educated, encouraged, and we monitor pretty consistently to make sure that the events are being submitted. Then we have various sorts of reports available online via the intermountain.net website that our um, quality Quality Patient Safety Department Data Analyst helps us with, and he's sitting next to me for the presentation. So if I misspeak, you can kick me. <laughs> um, but we continue to revise and hone those reports as well, as the fact that the data is embedded in an enterprise data warehouse, so it's in a data set or a data table that is then accessible by any of the data analysts in the facility, so they can do additional slicing and dicing. And then what we've done and what we cleaned from the literature was there really need to be people that are called champions, and you can call them what other title you want. Who is the quality falls lead? Who's the falls champion, falls expert, um, team leader, what other uh, titles you want for that. But there needs to be somebody who's been appointed and is supported by the organizational leadership. Then both from the literature and from my experience, it does you know good to have a nice risk assessment tool and good reports and good structure if it isn't actually implemented inside the patient care plans. And we survey to that. We have a robust internal quality survey program for regulatory readiness, and we survey to that process consistently. And then whatever your group or team is or your process is, you need to implement some sort of um, PDSA, PDCA, performance improvement, um, whatever your uh, nomenclature is that you use at your organization. Well, that's just getting started. Now, of course, there are lots of resources out there, and I would refer you to the VA Center for Patient Safety and to um, IHI. IHA has a best practice site for falls, and there are a lot of um, organizations out there that have published their success stories, as well as IHI has a falls toolkit. The Centers for Disease Control, um, CDC, also has a falls, uh, robust falls toolkit, but it's focused on the elderly. And for our intents and purposes today and for the hospital-acquired conditions that we're trying to reduce as part of the uh, partnership for patients and the hospital engagement network, we are focusing on inpatient falls. So patient age is a risk factor, but it's um, not totally the CDC information. So those are two references. We will link those on the Hand Learner website under the falls topic, so you'll have easy access to those. And those of you who have been working on fall prevention for a while probably already access this information and use it as well. We have an additional literature search um, and other references as well that's been submitted to the Institute here, and at some point we'll get that posted on the website as well. Um, AHRQ stated recently, and this was in a document in 2007, that the best fall prevention programs are multifactorial and interdisciplinary. And I thought this stated that very clearly, and that's what we've discovered at in and out, and that you need to be looking at the whole system and processes, equipment, structure, policies, procedure, education, from top down to the bottom, and it's got to be interdisciplinary. Yeah, you can't have a separate all prevention program in therapy, a different one in nursing services, and a different one in surgery. It needs to be integrated and collaborative. 
Well, that's best practice. So Intermountain started with a falls risk assessment tool, and when we developed our tool in 98, we went out and did the literature search, and there is much more evidence out there now around certain tools. Many that you may have heard of are the Morse tool, the Hendrick II, the Schmid, there are some others. Intermountains is really kind of a hybrid of these tools. We have several uh, major key components of the Morse and the Hendrick tool in our, uh, partic our patient risk assessment tool at this point in time. On the right side of the screen is a little timed get up and go test that the VA system uses. And they advocate that the primary care provider, so the physician, does the get up and go test as part of their inpatient um, admission process and that that information is used by nursing staff when they do their risk assessment and their fall prevention plan. Um, next, what we've done at Intermountain on the right hand side is just a screen of our embedded collaborative practice guideline. We have system wide protocols that are available online and you can get to them by keywords, but that's how we standardize our protocols particularly for nursing care and other disciplines. So it's embedded in the computer and then we've taken the risk assessment tool and embedded it in our computer charting system and into hard paper forms. Any computer charting system has to have downtime forms. So we've embedded the assessment tool into those downtime forms as well. As uh, some of our areas also, some of our ambulatory areas do not currently have access to the system standard inpatient charting tool yet, so they're still using paper. Then the other thing we have to do, and I say hard code the frequency of the system, of the assessment. Intermountain has had in our protocol the requirement that you must do the assessment upon admission and then a minimum of daily. Higher risk units do them at least once a shift. And what I mean by hard code is that we had it in the protocol and we had it in the education and in the computer, but we weren't forcing the function in terms of the fact that nurses could just skip over it or they could accept the previous nurse's assessment without actually reviewing it. So last year, one of the things we put into place is a hard stop. So if the risk assessment tool has not been completed during this nurse's shift, it's in bright red at the top of their screen every time they turn the computer on or go to do bedside charting that they have to complete that before they can sign off at the end of the shift. And that improved our frequency of the initial assessment and the daily assessment from about 94, 95% up to 99% completion. So I think it's been very helpful. And then, of course, monitoring compliance. We have a system where we do uh, routine medical records review as part of our ongoing quality performance and um, internal quality survey process and our desire to be continuously ready for surveys. So this is a another monitor where we do closed chart reviews or open chart reviews to see and have the nursing staff review each other. So we're monitoring local compliance as well. So that's the assessment tool, um, how it's embedded. Yeah, let's see, next. It's not going. There we go. Wasn't hood enough, push, pushing hard enough. Trying to transfer the slide, it didn't move forward, my apologies. So Intermountain's hybrid tools, we said this is just a screenshot on the right. It actually goes down to two pages, and we're looking to see if we can get permission to share the tool. What we've done, and the thing I want you to focus on with this, is that we have columns for the general population, and then our women in newborn postpartum folks and our pediatric folks have worked with us. The categories and the columns have the same basic um, attributes and criteria, but we've added in key descriptors for those specific populations. So for our pediatric, we still got the same history of falls. The impaired mobility, we added things like cerebral palsy, which is a frequent flyer for our primary children's medical center as well, so that we tried to make it more specific for the clinical settings. We also have an additional tool we use in outpatient ambulatory services. And they have the same categories, the history of falls, the mobility, the elimination problems, sensory deficit. But we have descriptors that are specific to that patient population to help those folks. And then we review and update our tool. Intermountain Healthcare does uh, we reuse all of our documents at least every three years. What our falls prevention team does is an, an annual literature review. We reassess what we've done and we set new goals for the next year. And we actually have been tweaking and modifying our tool as well as our protocol pretty much annually, um, as long as I've been working with. I've been with the Falls team since 2004. Get harder. 
Good to know. Okay. Staff education then is important in the getting started piece. You need to standardize it, and it's been kind of an interesting um, journey for us. Because people felt like their clinical settings were different, they wanted different education. And at one point, we had up to six different computer-based training tools and have been successful in taking that down to one uh, computer-based training module, which is what we call versioned. So this, what's on the screen is the introductory slide. The next slide, the learner self-clicks or self-checks the clinical area that they work in. So it's an inpatient area, an ambulatory area, support staff like imaging and lab services. Home care is also in here um, so that they then get content specific to their area. So that is an annual requirement for our staff. The other thing we've done along with that is we've sort of branded our falls images, fall prevention signs, made logos so that they, you get the visual uh, branding and the visual recognition across all our facilities and, and hospitals and, uh, and departments. So we have door signs, uh, we have posters, several different versions that people can use and put in staff rooms and public areas or in patient rooms as well. We have chart back stickers and door frame magnets. We found that the magnets worked better for us than having a sign on the door because the door kind of goes opens and shuts but the door frame doesn't move. So it's always right there in front of people's faces they walk through. And then we've added over the last couple of years specific skills pass off. Um, Intermountain has 22 hospitals and because of that we have 12 different bed models. Because as capital budgets become available and people have money, they'll get the newer beds. So we're in, it's, it was not uncommon in a large facility to have three or four different types of beds on one nursing unit. And we had we did some root cause analysis on several patient falls and found that one of our issues was the staff didn't know how to work the bed. They didn't know how to turn the fall alarms on or off. They didn't know how to put the bed in the right um, level, up or down, et cetera, because they were different beds. So we implemented some skills pass offs for that. That's a magic finger. We also have embedded patient family education. We have a fact sheet. You can see a screen print of that on the left side of the screen. This document is available in English and Spanish. It's on our intranet, it's print on demand, or you can actually order them from our printers and get a stack of them and put them in uh, patient rooms and waiting areas. One of the things that we did last year is we did a study of our falls. So after the fall, we implemented a post-fall assessment tool. And one of the things that we found was the second most common action was to re-educate the patient family. So when we looked at that, what we ended up doing was hard coding it into the computer charting. So when the nurse finishes the risk assessment and they determine that the patient is at risk of fall or that their fall's risk has increased, they are prompted with a little screen pop-up that says, this patient's at a risk for falls, would you like to print the patient education fact sheet at this point? We found that the feedback from the nurses was that this was much more um, so it was much more timely, and it's just in time, rather than giving all the patients being admitted the same information. And it meant more to the patients and the families because it was related to the nursing assessment and the, the uh, decision that they were at a risk for fall. So we've got good feedback on that, but that's one of those hard coding functions that we, we have been trying to build in. Then, of course, the posters and the door frame magnets, and then enlisting the patient and family engagement. We have a pilot project going right now at one of our facilities, and it was based on some work done at the University of Utah Medical Center. They're actually having the patients and families sign a commitment or agreement that says, we, we understand that I'm at a fall, at risk for fall. I promise I won't get out of bed without pushing the call light and making sure that I have someone there to assist me, um, those sorts of things, to, to, to elicit that engagement. So we'll be getting the results of that project in the next couple of months. Then let's move on to working harder. So we've talked a lot about some of the things you need to do to sort of get started. And most of the organizations, as we said earlier, are already at the working harder phase. What we've found to have the most impact is the champions. It's getting that focus, getting individuals who have been delegated, they're accountable, they've been given authority. And then our role as the fall prevention team is to get the right tools in the hands of those champions the right education content, um, good assessment materials, implementation plans and support, good preventative mechanisms, and then, of course, monitoring of the data and reports and getting that feedback to them. 
Oh, wait, let me show you. The picture on the left, when you have time to go back and look at that, if you look at that, the page, there's several things in there that pose a falls risk. So her walker is actually on top of the belt on her house coat, which is dragging along the floor, and there are obstacles in the room and other sorts of things. So it's actually a slide we pulled out of one of our education documents. So at Intermountain, what we've done in terms of the structure, so if we're working harder when we've got this leadership focus, we have a system fall prevention team. We have asked for and designated region teams and facility teams. And at Intermountain, we have 22 hospitals, and they're divided into geographic regions. So we have a north region, a central, a south, a southwest, and then we have a rural, which is a collection of six facilities that are 40 to 20 beds. So they, they have regions then that work together and learn across um, their organization. So those groups then report to the System Falls Prevention Team. Um, then each of those fall champion teams or their fall prevention teams must be multidisciplinary. And as a minimum, they need nursing services, uh, safety officers, physical therapy, pharmacy staff, and education resources participating on those teams. Okay, I've pulled some data from one of our references, Nursing Quality Network, as information that we use and share with our champions and teams and also as, as evidence as to why we really need to do this. So we need to empower the champions, designate the teams of committees as we've talked to. And then in Intermountain, one of the things we've done to work harder is link and connect with our Safe Patient Handling Program, which is a fairly new program for us. We just implemented a program that's policies, procedures, and equipment and training in 2008. So we're still getting um, some good gains out of that process. So nationally, 30 to 51% of the falls have injuries. We don't have quite that rate here. Ours is much lower, but we've been working on it for a while. Also nationally, they say 80 to 90 percent are unwitnessed. Um, at Intermountain, it's much less than that. It's around 20 to 30 percent. And those are unwitnessed, unassisted sorts of falls. 50 to 70 percent occur during transfer. We actually collect as part of our event reporting system. So when you submit a fall event or a patient event, it asks you what activities the patient was involved in when the fall occurred. And one of the criteria is during transfer. So we're capturing that data as part of our safe patient handling. So other parts of working harder, we've put together toolkits, if you will, similar to what IHI and the VA and other organizations have done. And so we put in the hands of the folks who are the facility champions and the region champions, the signs, the posters, the stickers, the assessment tools, wall chart tools, um, copies of the protocol, lots of references, reference lists, and I've got the references sliced and diced based on specific things. Assessment tools, um, the use of beds and bed alarms, the use of um, gate belts or lifting equipment, and then uh, underneath that things like um, polypharmacy, multiple medications, other things that are risk factors so that we can use that information and target uh, performance improvement to the specific unit. Um, lots of education, we've talked about that in the skills pass-off checklist. On the right is just one example of one of our signs, and it's got our Intermountain's colors are kind of blue and green and white, and our falls risk is a little logo with falling stars on it. We try and keep the colors and the image the same across all of our posters and education documents and the door frame magnets and chart, uh, chart back stickers. This is just a screenshot of one of the reports that we have. So we fully believe in making data transparent, and it's available on the intermountain.net on our web reports portal. And at the system level, we do uh, have process control charts. This particular one is a run chart, but uh, we do all falls, all falls with the different levels of injury, mild, moderate, severe, and uh, of course this is the inpatient falls. And you can see we've got a good trend with the injury pieces, and we've got some other data here we'll show you in a minute as well. Um, process control charts then again on the web are available at the system level, the region level, the facility level, and then some of our reports have data at the department level. When you get down to a department who only has maybe one fall every three or four months, it's, we don't do process control charts at that level, but they do have the data we can get to. So the important thing we can see here is that we have a really nice trend in, this is our falls with injuries which is also our board goal for this year. So in terms of the leadership commitment, last year our system level governing board chose to focus on reduction of inpatient falls. So we brought that down substantially. This year we're focusing on 
continuing the reduction of falls, but to continue and get better with the reduction in terms of injuries. And this fits well with the hospital acquired conditions and the falls with injuries uh, focus of CMS and AHRQ and others. Deep breath. There we go. Okay. Another part of working harder, I mentioned a minute ago, was our safe patient handling program. And in 2008, Intermountain implemented in our hospitals um, a, a patient assessment tool similar to the falls risk tool, a protocol a policy. We purchased equipment and then implemented computer-based training as well as skills pass-offs for all the pieces of the equipment. So on the right, you're seeing just examples of some of the equipment we made available. Um, there are slide sheets. There's an air mattress that we can use. There are several different portable lifts with different types of swings for both ambulation assist as well as um, lifting and turning immobilized patients. And we've tried to standardize, again, the theme, the color, and the image. For safe patient handling, what you see on the left is our, our image and the colors that we use for all of our signs and education. And we also have the door frame magnet and chart bag stickers for safe patient handling in addition to the falls piece. Forward. There we go. I hit, I hit it hard. Okay, let's talk about moving um, towards ahead of the curve. So if you've got your basic structure in place, you've got your policies, protocols, and assessment tools in place, got some teams in place, what are some of the things you can play with? So I've just listed a few things we've been working on at Intermountain. I'm trying to tailor the interventions that we use in the care plan specific to the individual patient risk. So if I'm an elderly individual, and I'm on blood pressure medication and an anticoagulant, one of the things that we're trying to do is target those folks for a patient safety attendant. So there would be somebody in the room. Because they kind of forget what they're doing, but the fact that they're elderly, they probably have osteoporosis, and they have, they're on anticoagulants, so they're at a higher risk of injury, we're putting an extra body in the patient's room. And we've standardized the protocol for that and the training of that individual and trying to standardize where we use those individuals as well. Um, if the patient has polypharmacy, multiple medications, and we think there's stuff that's affecting their gait and balance, then we're trying to target the interventions to those specific risk factors. Another thing that Intermountain has done for a number of years is what we call patient safety rounding. And we do them at several levels. There's a, a, a manager's rounding tool. There's a charge nurse rounding tool. There's a patient safety tool that anybody can use. Then there's a leadership rounding tool that the hospital administrators use. And we've embedded in each of those rounding tools specific questions around several patient safety items, and one of them is the false risk piece. Um, some folks do the one that's called three Ps or four Ps, pain, potty, et cetera. So other things, do you need water, do you need to go to the bathroom, and they're doing hourly rounding. And that's specific to high-risk units. We don't do that everywhere. Another big thing we've spent a lot of time on over the last couple of years is because we've had various levels of equipment across the system, you know, different types of bed models, different ages, um, we did a, a mandatory inspection of every bed across the system to validate that the bed um, exit alarm was functioning properly and that the beds were connected correctly to the nurse call systems where they had that capability. Where we did not have that capability, we're getting capital dollars to upgrade the beds and capital dollars to upgrade the nurse call system so we can keep that connection. Another big thing we found is that in our mountain, depending on the facility you're at, 40 to 60 percent of the falls occur around toileting activities and transferring in and out, you know, from the bed to the chair, the commode, into the bathroom. So we pilot tested in one of our facilities a toilet alarm and a chair alarm, and both of these alarms can be connected to the nurse call system. You unplug the nurse call button and plug in the, the alarm as well, and we've been having very good results where we've implemented that tool. And then other, other areas we've worked on a lot is embedding in our computer systems more decision algorithms and logic to support the nurses. An example was the one that doesn't let them bypass the false risk assessment. They have to open it up and they have to acknowledge that it's correct. And then the prompt to do the patient family education piece as well. 
So now I get to speak for Vicki Vicki Spuler um, as our Respiratory ICU Manager. She actually presented at um, the IHI conference last December, and she has a whole presentation on improving mobility in intensive care and the outcomes, uh, improvement that they've seen over time. She couches the, the whole mobility piece, and I've talked about safe patient handling, but this is mobility and activating, actively getting the folks out of bed quicker um, as part of a key strategy to improve long-term outcomes of all ICU patients. And they work specifically on making sure the patient's getting the right sleep, that the sedation is, they get sedation and vacations, so and we keep the sedation as light as possible when patients are on ventilators. That we're managing the medications and focusing on the delirium and the confusion that folks get and getting them out of bed quicker and faster. And they get patients out of bed while they're on the ventilators and all their tubes attached. Getting that patient up and moving keeps the muscle strength and everything else. <clears throat> Next slide. We're trying. There we go. So this is a, a mobility affinity diagram, and she has some really nice notes on this. So if there's material you'd like around the mobility project, I believe they have a couple papers that have been published as well. We can give that to you. So these are theirs. It's the same four-legged chair, but in a little different picture. Um, reduce the sedation, make sure they're getting the right sleep, and improving the mobility makes the whole outcome better. This is a... Um, description of what's been seen more in the literature in intensive care over the past few years is this post-intensive care syndrome. And they're actually finding that the longer length of stays in ICU, when you look at the patient's quality of life and their ability to return to their activities of daily living post-discharge, um, can be greatly impacted by increasing the mobility, uh, reducing the sedation, getting the patient moving quicker and faster. They've done some studies where they've actually looked at the folks after discharge, and even you know, multiple trauma patient at 30, 40 years old is an active, productive member of society. If their intensive care unit stay was longer and they were in bed longer, many of those people are not able to return to activities of daily life or even get back to work. So they're really focusing on the physical impairments, working with the families, ambulating the patients, and reducing the, the uh, sensory deficits, improving sleep, et cetera. So these are some outcomes that they have. We need to fix those. So we've typed in the dollars over the top of the bar chart because you couldn't read it. So at post, uh, post improvement project with their mobility, they reduced the average cost per day from 2,700 to 1,500 per day um, in their intensive care unit, the shock trauma intensive care unit, respiratory intensive care unit. And the uh, 2009, 10, the 11 data and the 99, 2002 data was adjusted for cost. I mean, for the uh, cost per unit of service and the charge master stuff. Okay. And this is an improvement of their length of stay. So a reduction in ICU length of stay, which really makes CMS happy, um, significant reduction with their mobility project and uh, sedation vacation, those other initiatives. Then their discharge disposition, and this was one slide that they focused on at their IHI conference as well, is that we are getting patients, so it's just then and now, so it's the previous and the before. We're getting patients home rather than to care facilities. So a SNF is a skilled nursing facility or rehab. So 67% of the folks are going home with a little bit of home care versus having to go to another care facility, which again is big bucks in terms of reduction of cost, but it's also getting the folks back into their environment and having much more success with return to their, um, their work life and their normal function. So good, good outcomes with their process. And then they, of course, have all kinds of protocols. They have some decision algorithms and computer-based decision uh, charting tools as well. Um, let's, let's talk a minute about uh, staying ahead of the curve and improving your rates. Uh, one of the things that we've done, and thanks to Eric Crawford for doing this for me, but we've looked over the past few years to, at some of the projects, big system projects, and ha have redone our process control charts to show the significant improvement that we've been able to get from the different programs. So mandatory falls risk training, it used to be optional, now it's mandatory, we track it. The whole safe patient handling initiative, again, lowered the mean as well as the upper and lower control limits. And then launching of our patient uh, safety teams, the fall champion teams, the system board goal in 2011 and 2012, and then the bed inspection that we did last year and the focus on integration of the bed alarms of the nurse call systems and those sorts of things that continue to 
drive our rate down. So this is the falls with injury per thousand patient days. Um, this is a graph, and I have to show you this because it's, it's kind of funny. Um, we, this is the run chart. We do have process control charts, but it's patient falls related to transfer and lifting, and that's one of the criteria I talked about earlier that we have in our event system. To report a fall, you have to say what activity the patient was involved in. Last year when we targeted patient falls reduction as our board goal, we saw a spike in falls related to transfer and lifting and a related spike in employee injuries related to transfer and lifting activities. And when I interviewed and talked to both the falls prevention team and the safe patient handling team, they both said, well, we're trying to meet the board goal, so we're not letting people walk by themselves. But what they were not doing was they weren't using the appropriate ambulation slings or lifts or gate belts. And so third and fourth quarter last year, we focused on the use of gate belts for assistance with ambulation. And in first quarter, actually, the rate is back down to 0 0.26. So hopefully we'll get some performance improvement out of that. But that was kind of one of those unintended consequences. So if you focus on fall prevention, you better expect the employees to get hurt. Right. Which I really wasn't happy about, but it was. Okay. Other things in terms of staying ahead of the curve and continuing to drive improvement. As I mentioned, it's, it's a system board goal for in a mountain for 11 and 12. We changed the education from recommended to mandatory. So what that means at Intermountain is the employees can't just skip it, and if they don't complete it, they don't get a met on their performance appraisal. Therefore, they don't get their payroll uh, pay raise at the end of the year. So we, we don't like to get heavy-handed and we have to, but sometimes you need to do that. So that's one thing that we did. Um, and then connection, the, the physical connection between safe patient handling and the fall prevention champions. And we have a similar structure for safe patient handling as we do with the falls prevention with the system team and the region and facility team and champions at the facility and unit levels. And so this year we've been focusing on making sure those folks are partnering, that they're working together for employee uh, education, for patient family education, and as they look at um, making sure the patients don't fall again so we don't have frequent flyers. And then as the work I reported on terms of uh, working on our beds and the bed alarm integration with nurse call systems. And we're really recommending that we get more of the smart beds. We have a lot of beds in the system where the alarms work great. The nurse has to turn it off when they get the patient out of the bed. They go to the bathroom, they come back, and the nurse has to remember to turn it back on. The newer, smarter beds turn themselves on once the patient sits down on the bed. So that's one of the things that we think will help us. It's a human factors issue in terms of, I'm so busy, I forget all the things. I got their IV hooked up and I handed them their nurse call, but I forgot to turn the bed alarm on. Uh, continue, other things we're doing to drive improvement. Last year we uh, implemented what we call a post-fall tool, assessment tool, and requested that they hold what's called a care team huddle. So if once you do have, we want to do everything we can to prevent the fall, but once there is a fall, then we want the care team to formally meet. They fill in a piece of paper, it's an assessment tool, and say, what were the factors that contributed to the fall? What did I do after that to prevent the fall from reoccurring? And then we harvested that data for some of the performance improvement we've done this year. Um, and then, of course, we talked a minute ago about the gate belts and making sure we're using those for ambulation. And on the right-hand side is a little, it's a sticker and a doorframe magnet that we use. The nurse assesses the patient and determines that they really need standby assist. They need somebody with them when they're ambulating. We can put this on the doorframe along with their falls risk tool. Next slide. Other things, um, we, we firmly believe at Intermountain you really need to tell your stories. And I guess that's part of what we're doing here today as well. But getting the folks at the front line to tell their stories, not just Marlin at the corporate office telling the stories, I think has got, um, gives us more power at the unit level. So this is just a, it's an excerpt from one of the stories we ran le recently, and this happens to be the LDS Hospital Med Medical Surgical ICU unit as well, and they have had really good success. This is their, the, one of the units that participated in the mobility project that I reported on for Vicki Steeler's um, program as well. And um, they interviewed the staff, interviewed the patient, and are really high-end users of, of all of our lift equipment and getting the patients out of it. So it makes more sense and it means more to frontline staff if they get to hear each other's stories and then tell the stories themselves. We're getting close. Other things we've done, done in terms of forcing, uh, forcing functions was the computer logic on the right-hand side is just a little screen print that says, you want to print the fall fact sheet, you know, because the patient's at risk for falls. And then the safety rounds piece. 
Intermountain has a, another database. It's an application that's available on our intranet. And we encourage our leaders and managers to enter their rounding data into that tool. It's a database, so they can get reports out of it. And then use it for performance improvement at their unit level. Let's talk about measures. Um, and these measures are straight from the mountain and why they're measures that CMS and AHRQ and other folks have been advocating for years. And I won't read the detail, but you've got on here the falls per thousand patient days is what we use at the benchmark. It's a common measure. Um, and this is the definition that we use as well as that's consistent with NDNQI. So that's the first one, falls per thousand patient days. Next slide. You just got magic fingers, not magic fingers. Why is it slow? Can I enter? Oh. Okay, and the next one is falls with injury per thousand patient days. So we define injury um, using the, the modified table from the NCC MERP, that's the um, National Council for Medication Safety, but it, it, it defines for us as objectively as possible mild, moderate, and severe levels of injury. And we use that uh, and calculate the rates. Those are available at the, the web graph and the web reports as well. Next one. Assisted and unassisted falls. So when the staff member enters the fall, they have to say, was this patient assisted or unassisted? And, um, if, and then we track that separately. And what we're trying to do with the safe patient handling and mobility is increase, increase the proportion of assisted versus unassisted, because you want to be able to predict the patients that are at risk for fall and make sure they're not left alone. And the literature shows us that if the patient has an assisted fall rather than unassisted, that injury is significantly reduced. And then some other things we monitor is falls by risk level, so inside the event system, we, when they enter it in, they have to put in the actual score, the falls risk score. Then we look at the falls related to transfers as part of our safe patient handling project. And we have uh, some medical review, medical record review data. We collect this from the medical records itself. So I am through with the formal part of this presentation and would like to open it up for questions. I guess the two main questions are, um, what tools and documents would you like to have posted on the hand learner site? We'll start with that question, and then the next question is going to be, what would you be willing to share, or what is best practice? How do we open that up? Manel, please open the line. Yes. I need to have control back. There you go. Thank you. Do we have any questions from our participants? One point of clarification that I might like to make, this is Amy with Rich. Um, the outcome measures and the process measures that Marlene spoke about will actually be what we'll be using and collecting from our um, hen hospitals that are real-time and active learners. So we'll, we'll talk in more detail and give you information on how we'll be collecting those, but those will be the measures that we'll be collecting from our hospitals as well. Okay, there's a question on the screen. It says, when did you implement rounding? At Intermountain Healthcare, we implemented a formal rounding process about four or five years ago, and it was part of our service quality, service excellence initiative um, related to our HCAP satisfaction survey scores. And we have a system level service quality director who helps us with that, and they, they developed the different levels of rounding tools. And then we've tweaked that over the years and added the additional patient safety questions as well. Uh, okay, somebody said please post all tools that you referred to in your PowerPoint slide document. And I'm working with our, our legal and our transparency approval committee to get permission to share those documents. So my intention is to share um, some of our the patient education fact sheet 
the fall, the tool, the wrist tool, excuse me, um, and, and then some of the signs or posters. Are there other documents that folks would like to have? Okay, we'll wait for feedback on that. Another question says, what did you say about the measures for submitting data? Amy, you said more information to come? We will be providing more information, but the measures that we will be um, asking you to submit are the measures that Marlin spoke about. Does that answer your question? Okay, another question was, did you make any changes to the patient environment as a result of this work? And that's an excellent question. In fact, yes, we did. And I've been working with our facility architects. And we have 22 hospitals, and we tend to build new hospitals periodically. We opened up two new ones three years ago. We have another one planned for a couple of years down the road. But I've been working with the facility architects to put together a fall risk environmental assessment tool, which is a series of questions and things we look at. In fact, I had a wonderful opportunity. We opened up um, our Intermountain Medical Center in the end of 2007. We closed down one of our mid-sized hospitals which was the Cottonwood Hospital. And on that same campus is the orthopedic specialty hospital. And because we were tearing down the patient tower, they retrofitted an office building for patient room. And their fall rate, they're an orthopedic specialty hospital, so their fall rate's going to be higher to begin with. They have a higher percentage of their patients who are at risk for falls. But I kept getting these complaints from the nurses saying, well, the patient's tripping over the bathroom threshold. There's too many wires, and, there's, and the, but then the uh, electrical outlets aren't where they need to be, et cetera, et cetera. So I took our false risk assessment tool, and I went into the facility and did a room-by-room -room inspection with our system safety officer and with our representative that does the bed and the nurse call system. And we went in and looked at the room. And there are requirements that door thresholds not have lips beyond a quarter of an inch. And we were upwards of an inch and a half in some of those rooms, in the, going from the patient room into the bathroom. And the problem was we retrofitted an office building for patient rooms. And in order to get the proper drain in the shower and the toilets, we had to raise the bathroom floor. So what we ended up doing was retrofitting. We actually ended up sloping the floor out about two or three feet from the bathroom door. So we had to pull up the floor, lay down concrete, slope it, put the floor back down, redo the threshold. And another issue in that one was they didn't have the electrical plugs were like three feet out from the sides of the head of the bed. So all of the cords were strung out across the room. And in that orthopedic unit, they have CPM machines and two or three different IV pumps, a pain pump, an, anesthesia, uh, an antibiotic pump. Uh, they may have had oxygen, other sorts of things. We had so many tools and whatnot going all over the place. It was driving them nuts. So we have a tool, and yes, we, we did those changes as well. I've been working with engineering and architects to go back in and relook at a lot of the rooms and get the carpet out of the patient room. People trip on carpet. It's easier on the floor. Of course, you've got to keep the floors clean and dry. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so those are some of the things we've looked at. Another question? Um, would love to be able to see your tool for peds and women's health population. So that is part of our tool, and we're going to get the... Uh, trying to get permission on that. But what it's the same categories, but what we did is we modified the descriptors related to the mobility or the, the visual issues of the medication, those sorts of things. So yes. Other questions? Since I joined late, but I'm curious if you had challenges related to proactively using safe patient handling equipment. Yeah, that's a whole other conversation. You're absolutely right. That's been my biggest barrier is changing the paradigm and the belief of the bedside care process to use the equipment and stop lifting patients with their backs and their arms and legs. So we're still battling that, but we do have um, 40 to 60 percent reduction in employee injuries, which is significant because Intermountain is self-insured for our workers' compensation. So our risk management folks are really interested in that. Okay, another question is, do you use restraints, especially vests, as a resource in this protocol? Only as a last-ditch effort, and it is inside our protocol. And if you can't, if the patient is confused and not likely or able to follow commands, then we do recommend that you use um, a safety restraint, um, a vest, or um, upper arm restraints. We try not to use that. We actually have a few facilities who are restraint-free, and what they do is they use the patient safety attendants. 
Now that's a fairly substantial resource, but when you look at all of the CMS and the Joint Commission requirements around restraint use and monitoring, you have to have an order for the restraints, you have to do the physical evaluation, you have to monitor a dozen different pieces of data for that. It's actually cheaper to just put a PSA at the bedside and not initiate the restraint. So good question. Any other questions? Um, the second question was, who would be willing to share improvements or best practice? Okay, we do have another question. Who's involved in a post-fall care team huddle? The request is that it be the care team on the unit. So that would be the RN, the CNA, the therapist. Um, all of our units have clinical pharmacists assigned to them, um, the charge nurse, those sorts of folks available, and they need to be filling in the document, and I didn't show you the document, but it's a series of questions as to what factors contributed to the fall and then what they're going to do to prevent the fall. Any other questions? Probably we'll think of some afterwards. So we keep those for the affinity call and Amy, oh, let's go to, did we go to that slide? Can we go to that slide? Like we didn't go to that slide. Keep the conversation going. I can, I can announce that. Okay. So as part of our um, ongoing commitment to providing the information that you need, we're announcing affinity calls around each of our health um, areas, our priority areas that we're addressing with the HEN. Our first one will be the fall affinity call, and it will be um, the second Friday of each month. We'll begin in July, so that's Friday the 13th. Um, we hope that that's not Okay. Prophetic, but um, the information for how to call in is posted on henlearner.org in the calendar. I posted it just a few minutes ago, so it's available. It will be, to begin with, we'll kind of um, not necessarily have an agenda, but look at what kind of questions we get and address those in the affinity calls. Marlin will be available for those, so you'll have expert guidance. And we also expect it to be a place where our hen um, hospitals can share what they're doing, what for them, and hopefully help each other out. So that information will be on henlearner.org on the calendar information, and I will also be putting up a blog post about it um, later this week. Any other questions? Okay. Marlene, do you have anything else to add? No, other than this is a journey, and nobody's perfect. So, but we're all in this together and we want to learn and share. Thank you for joining our webinar and we look forward to having the um, recorded webinar up in a couple of days. Please go to henlearner.org to access that information. Thank you.